Thanks so much for your patience here as I work from a temporary studio till I get my main computer in. Uh, let me reiterate a few things that I said earlier and uh, in case you missed them. I'm working on a couple of projects. Uh, one is relatively small. The other is not small at all. Um, the first one is that I am... Um, trying to incorporate new ways for people to interact with the radio podcast. And uh, so one of those is an idea I got from Armin Navabi at Atheist Republic. They do, I think he calls it Atheist Voicemails. And I was talking to him about you know, the options for uh, that on even my own show. Blog Talk Radio Switchboard is a little bit problematic. I try to do live shows whenever I can, but we've been having to do more FaceTimes and not FaceTimes, live streams, Google Hangouts, etc. And the reason we've been doing that is because it is, um, uh, uh, it's a little less glitchy than blog talk radio switchboard. But what if people were able to leave voicemails for consideration, not necessarily automatically getting on the radio, but if they had a comment or question, they wanted to leave it in voicemail form. That is, something I'd like to explore. And so temporarily at thethinkingatheist.com slash podcast, I've set up a podcast voicemails application. It's kind of a, a widget, for lack of a better word, that is offered for the site for that particular platform. I'm still experimenting with a very basic version. It's not the paid version. Uh, I think there's a limit on the length of the message you can receive. There's a limit, I think, on the number of messages I can actually view. You know, they put all these restrictions on it, hoping that you'll buy the actual widget. But I'm not going to do that until I know it works for sure. So if you'd like to help me with that, if you want to leave a voicemail, comment or question, something you might submit for a radio show, do so at thethinkingatheist.com slash podcast. Let's see if it works. Let's see if it's something that might be another way for listeners and viewers to plug in to get uh, their own comments and questions on the broadcast. And then I can sort of respond to those. And if you have a question or we can just air the comments and string those together. Uh, I don't know. It's an option. It's a possibility. So let's explore that possibility together. Let me know if it works for you. Thethinkingatheist.com slash podcast. Let me switch over to the uh, chat screen here. Camera just a bit. I'm trying to make some adjustments. There's a little bit of a, a hiss in the audio. Please forgive me. Um, the second thing is, is that I'm working on a replacement for the original Refuting the Bible page that I once had on the Thinking Atheist. It's not up now, and that's a temporary pause. Uh, Refuting the Bible was originally started back in 2009 when the website went up, and it was a very rudimentary look at you know Bible criticism taking apart the inconsistencies, the contradictions, the immorality, the problems the Bible has with our own history, with science, those types of things. And so um, it's been improved over the years, and then we tried a searchable database where people could type in something like slavery, and then all the slavery scriptures would come up. But that was problematic. We didn't really have a lot of success with it. So I have, for the moment withdrawn the page for a redesign and i'm going to ask because i'm just one guy and uh, always looking for opportunities to outsource whenever i can um i'm asking if you will help uh, if you're interested if you have any experience at all with dealing with the inaccuracies the immorality of scripture um the problems with bible history the problems with bible and our own reason uh, and we're going to go book by book, Genesis through Revelation, and I'm going to then reformat that into an intuitive, easy-to-navigate page or even a free-standing website, a resource for people who are in discussions with apologists and they want to have that, and they can use it on their smartphones. It's going to take a few months to do properly. There are other great resources already out there that have been mentioned by many of my viewers and listeners. You can go to Evil Bible, the Skeptics Annotated Bible. This will just be another tool in the tool chest. No one's going to reinvent the wheel, right? Most, I mean, the Bible's been the same for however many, you know, 1,700 years, uh, largely, even though there are thousands of conflicting versions of uh, Christian doctrine, there is always room for you know, a well-formatted, easy-to-navigate resource 
for everyday apologists or counter apologists rather who want to go out there and deal with these claims, biblical claims. So if you'd like to participate, you let me know at Seth at the thinking atheist.com. Just put refuting the Bible in the description box or in the subject header so I know what that's about. There's no guarantee I'm going to be able to use everybody who is submitting. And I want some, I really don't want anybody who is starting from scratch, who has no knowledge of the Bible. <laughs> Right, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who's actually relatively well versed in many of these discussions, who has been through Bible criticism, who understands uh, how these arguments work. If you are already sort of dipping your, you know, at least your you know, up to your torso in these waters, then let's talk. Seth at the Thinking Atheist dot com. Uh, gonna go for it, says, do we know for sure the hiss isn't the serpent trying to mess with the stream? I'll tell you what the problem is, is that because I'm working off of a laptop and using an, a Canon A20 as the camera, I'm sourcing through a video camera that I think is adding a little bit of noise to the mic feed, and I don't know why. Uh, Yblog says, "Why? how about we stop flogging a dead horse, wasting, wasting time bashing religion? Let religious nuts be the ones feeling left behind in their illusion. Wouldn't that be amazing if religion was an island unto itself and it didn't ripple out into the lives of other people? It didn't have any negative consequences for those of us who were trying to operate under the rule of law, under the influence of politicians, under cultural influences and religious privilege being exhibited every single day in our lives. Wouldn't it be wonderful if religion wasn't targeting the vulnerable in their hours of need, going after people at their most desperate hours and trying to co-opt that desperation to sell a religious message, often at the end of an offering plate? Wouldn't it be wonderful if religion wasn't targeting young children, young, innocent, and impressionable children with thoughts of magic and gods and monsters and heaven and hell and shame Bending, perverting their own perceptions of self-worth, identity, sexuality. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just let religion do what religion is going to do and nobody would be negatively affected? Alas, that is not the world that we live in. I'm not here to bash religion for its own sake. I'm speaking out against the damage done by religion because I'm a citizen of the world and I want to see people who are damaged protected from the negative influence. The superstitious, the theocrats, the people who are exerting religious privilege, who are claiming for themselves rights they want to deny to other people, who are trying to bend the law and the culture, the culture rather, to resemble them. Those people are not going to go away simply because we sit on our hands and decide, well, let the religious be the religious. Religion by design, especially fundamental religion, by design, is proactive. It's designed to go ye into all the world and make, uh, wait, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Islam, you think Islam is an island unto itself? We should just leave it alone? Let them stew in their own juices? Or are they outward focused, trying to co opt the rest of the world? It just ain't a part of it, it just irritates me. Why can't you just leave religion alone? Well, the reason I can't is because religion won't leave the rest of the world alone. If these were people who simply lived in their tiny pods and had an inward-focused belief that didn't betray the trust of young children and didn't shame people for not fitting into their cookie cutters and didn't exert extreme privilege in almost every circumstance, if that was the case, it really wouldn't be a problem. But that's not how fundamental religion operates. Yblog says, how about we project a solution rather than reacting to the pollution? Robert Green Ingersoll once said that the more false we destroy, the more room we make for the true. Now, I'm all about building and creating a positive. And you're right that we need to provide an alternative uh, a reality-based alternative for the community that people find in religion and a humanism-based hope that people find in religion. 
those types of things, to root them in the real world and show them that the best stuff that religion provides really isn't superstitious at all. It's all human. I get that. But the more false we destroy, the more room we make for the true. So how in the world do you debunk mythology or how do you reveal that mythology has been debunked without actually having a discussion about the debunking of mythology you're going to have to dismantle what has been falsely promoted you're going to have to address the false claims that are being made it's not backward looking to do so it's it's not many people say that that's why atheism is a religion is because you're simply ex exhibiting another belief system my atheism is actually a response. My atheist activism is a response to the religious messages that have been proffered for thousands upon thousands of years. And religion has had carte blanche to be as loud as it wants. It's extremely influential and well-funded. It's given a tremendous amount of privilege out there and deference. All oh, these sacred cows cannot be challenged or touched. This is what we're up against. We're going to have to dismantle the false while we are also promoting the true. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Who else is on the chat room here? Going to go for it said it's not about bashing religion, it's about educating people. We can't stop doing that. If you educate people about how religions are born i love that line is it uh, dillahunty likes to say that if you teach a child one religion you indoctrinate them if you teach a child all religions you inoculate them now it's not always the case but i love the idea of teaching how religions formed the evolution of religions how they helped to establish and fortify tribes and tribalistic thinking among higher primates. The placebo effect that some people get when they lean on prayer. I'm going through a situation in my own circle right now. Somebody got cancer in the family, and I'm surrounded by the prayer platitudes. Prayers, sending prayers, prayers, pray, 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 praying, 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 while the person is in the hospital undergoing hugely invasive treatment for the curing of cancer. It's hard to watch, but it's also interesting to watch people get together in the placebo effect, you know, of feeling better, feeling more emotionally uh, sound in that way. Does this produce an actual physiological effect in the patient? Um, quite frankly, you can pray all you want as long as it doesn't keep this person from seeking real world treatment by healthcare professionals rooted in science. Um, let's explore how religions operate, what they teach, what they do, what they don't do, and why. Great. But I just don't think you can get into those discussions without debunking the magical elements of religions. You know, that there's a divine wizard out there in the clouds who has a proper name, who has a specific will and created hundreds of millions of galaxies so that little pithy humans could be the center of the universe. In fact, little pithy tribes on a single rock inside of hundreds of millions of galaxies can be the preferred people of the almighty king. Yeah, we have to debunk that because it's horseshit. Because the more false we destroy, the more room we make for the true. It's amazing what people believe in the name of their religion. I'll tell this story again. Someone in my outer social circle posts this on Facebook, and I just about levitated out of my chair. They said, The Christmas tree. The Christmas tree reflects the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. She's trying to tie the Christmas tree as a symbol into Christmas, the Christmas holiday. Now, anyone who's had any of these discussions about Christmas understands the pagan roots of almost all Christmas traditions. And we've seen the Christians who are like, well, you know, 
Christmas is the birthday of Jesus, and that's how the holiday began. They revealed their own ignorance about the holiday itself, where it came from, and the many traditions. I did a whole video about this for Atheist TV called Christmas Behind the Curtains. You know, we get into the Yule Logs, the Norse a festival where they would light the big uh, bonfire with the logs, and they would essentially have a party, a festival, until the last ember of the fire burned out. And we would talk about the giving of gifts. This was part of the Saturnalia thing. We would talk about um, uh, the, the return of the sun, not the sun of God, but the actual sun in the sky, the sun that would warm the earth after the winter solstice was over uh, and bring, hopefully, a bountiful harvest and the sacrifices they would make, the honorings that they would make with evergreen boughs to appease the gods so that the harvest in the following spring, when the weather warmed, would be great, blah, blah, blah. This person said the Christmas tree is representative of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Okay, well, that ought to be an interesting story. Let's see how this works. And of course, uh, someone had mentioned earlier, and they were right, well, wouldn't that be Easter? Isn't Easter the holiday where Jesus is crucified? She said, when you cut down the Christmas tree, when you cut down the tree, it's like when we put Jesus up on the cross and we cut down his life. All right. Okay. We're already seeing, we're hearing the stretching sounds. <laughs> okay. We're hearing the, the, the breaking of, of, the, uh, of the bonds of reason already. Okay. And then, then whenever you put the tree back up in your house, it's like Jesus being resurrected on the third day. Excuse me? Okay, All right. All right. so let's take that metaphor even further. All right, I go out and I'm in the forest filled with evergreen trees for me to select for Christmas. I take my little hatchet or whatever and I chop down the tree. I am chopping down Jesus Christ as he was cut down by sinful humanity for the sake of saving us all. All right, all right. Jesus then falls which is, I guess, how they take him off of the cross. Is he, they, they cut him down, they unhooked him, they pried out the spikes, whatever. And so he falls. And then, you know, when you put the tree on the top of the station wagon, it's like when they put Jesus on the big roll cart to carry him off to the tomb. And then when you put him in the tomb, it's sort of like when you drag the tree through the front door of your house. And then when you stand the tree back up, it is like Jesus rising from the grave on the third day. I just don't get it. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the pretzel-type shapes people will bend themselves into to make pagan symbolism look like Jesus symbolism. What the f <laughs> I didn't say any, I didn't jump into that particular thread because I just didn't feel like having the argument. I mean, I, you know, embarrassing this person in this moment was, was not my desire. There might be a conversation we have personally. Uh, if we bump into each other again, I'll be like, you know, you realize that you're talking about a pagan fertility symbol and a symbol for the uh, end of the winter solstice and the return of the longer days, warmer temperatures and a bountiful harvest and the you understand they were praying to Saturnalia, and that's why the evergreen boughs and the trees all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I might have that conversation. You know, I, 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 uh, I wasn't going to to have that. But I mean, it, there does come a time when the record does need to be corrected. Does truth matter? Do the facts matter? It's a cost-benefit discussion. Anytime I see these things pop up, do I engage and bother to correct? The record. If this person isn't listening, are there other people in the circle who might be listening? Um, I just—I don't know. I just was astounded. 
by the and then of course we're getting ready for the war on Christmas stuff. I think Aaron Raw and I are going to do a whole broadcast in December about the pagan origins of many Christmas traditions. And to get Aaron wound up on this subject is going to be a blast. I'm still getting the specifics in, but we're going to try to get together and make that happen for you in the month of uh, December. You know, you look at uh, the idea that the wise men followed a star. I mean. Ask any astrophysicist about this one. That, wait, I'm sorry. A star? Like our blazing sun type star? They just followed it in a specific direction until it landed and was hanging over the top of the manger. <laughs> it makes no sense. The idea of Herod. Yeah, in, in Was it the book of Matthew where Herod is slaughtering the firstborn and Luke doesn't even bother mentioning Herod? Or maybe I inverted those. It's one or the other. I don't know. Bah. Herod, ah, who cares about Herod? No one really cares. In uh, one story, after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph returned to their home in Nazareth. And in another book, they, uh, they actually don't go to Nazareth. I think they go off to Jerusalem. Um, you know, you look at the specifics of the Mary and Joseph story. Why in the world was a nine-month pregnant woman being dragged around on the back of a mule or donkey uh, whenever only the male heads of household were supposed to register for the census and the registration would actually have taken place in their city of residence, which would have required no travel at all. So the idea they had to travel to go to the census and especially the idea that he would drag his poor wife along, even though she wasn't required for that. And there wasn't even a census in the supposed year that Jesus was born. I mean, on every level, the whole story falls apart. Now, I'm one of those weird atheists. I guess I'm not all that weird. I enjoy Christmas. Christmas music, not so much. Christmas, yeah. I call it Christmas. I don't, it's what we uh, always say colloquially known as uh, the holiday as. It's Christmas, right? It's Christmas. Uh, and I'll use the word Christmas much to the chagrin of some atheists out there. They're they take great pains not to, to use the word. And I'm like, why? You know, I, I don't believe in Luna, but I call Monday, Monday, the moon's day. Uh, Wednesday was for Wotan. Thursday, I don't believe in Thor. I, you know, Thor's day. I still call it Thor's day. Saturn, the god Saturn is where we get Saturday. I don't believe in Saturn, but that's what we know the name as. I can call it Christmas. Okay, I don't believe in saints, and I celebrate All Saints Eve, Halloween. Um, so, you know, the idea that we get caught up on what you're going to name it, I mean, it doesn't mean I hold to the supernatural aspects of Christmas, and, and I, I especially hold to the idea that we can make the holiday whatever we want. If you want to spend it with your family? Wonderful. If your family drives you batshit crazy, avoid them at all costs. And spend time with those you do love and care about and want to spend time with. If you want to go out and party, great. If you want to stay home and just put something on the television, fantastic. You know, make the holiday whatever you want. If it's about a favorite food, it's about playing games, it's about some other thing that marks the occasion. It's, it's your day. It's your party. Do it the way you want to. So, you know, the idea that uh, we reject Christmas because the word Christ is in the title, I, I don't buy that at all. Um, and we all, anybody who's done a most cursory look at the holiday realizes that Christmas isn't a Christ day. Yeah, Christmas is really, um, it's kind of a pagan thing. And the Christians borrowed it for Christ. Christmas is, it's for anybody and everybody who wants to participate on their terms. So anyway, I just did my soapbox on it. R and Raw, month of December. Stick around. He and I are going to have a conversation, and we'll try to uh, chat with as many of our listeners as we can and see what they have to offer. Uh, anybody else? Heavy Metal Zombie Pilot, what a great name, said, Do you think atheism spreads throughout the U.S.? Will it ever reach the rural areas? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's, <laughs> it's like looking at a map of the red and the blue states, um, where the blue areas are mostly the, the population centers, the major cities, and what might be argued as the hubs of information. 
Uh, I think that anything is possible, but I think when it comes to the Bible Belt heartland of the United States, it's going to take a lot longer. Not because uh, people are dumb, but I think that um, they are much more married to the culture, this sort of God and country, go to church on Sunday, pray before meals and bedtime culture. There's more of that sort of sentiment in uh, the sort of Midwest, the Southwest, and the su southern parts of the United States, and it's going to be hard because people take a lot of comfort in that culture. Uh, have you ever seen the Vigilant Christians videos? I have uh, not. Andrew says they are amazingly crazy. Shura says what kills me about Christians is they believe something that isn't even original. It's an amalgamation of past beliefs and myths compiled. And they probably sprinkled in some of their own original stuff as well. Biddy says, have you seen the Tesla Tower that's up in Texas? Is a Tesla Tower in Texas? There's crosses all over Texas, but I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a Tesla Tower. Um, true Tech says, lots of churches are closing down. That's absolutely true. The only downside to the 30 and unders being less and less plugged into religion, being the nuns or non-religious. The one downside is that many of them aren't necessarily atheists. They are just, religion plays no part in their lives. They haven't explored the God question. And many of them are apatheists. And that bugs me a little bit, because if they are not plugged in to why it matters to speak out against debunked mythologies, and they retreat from those discussions because they just don't care, well, that gives a lot more latitude to those who would operate in the shadow, or hell, not just in the shadows, out in the open, who are uh, trying to co-opt the culture. Ah, uh, you know, let religion do what it wants. And we're back to that sentiment again. No, the more false we destroy, the more room we will make for the true Adrian says, one thing I hate about Christmas, the massive amount of work I work at the post office. Post office and retail, you have my respect and my gratitude. Knockdown says, I think the relationship between atheists and theists would be so much better if we just agreed to disagree and avoid pushing either side into the other. Let me try that a little differently. I don't think we leave it as let's agree to disagree. I think we can passionately disagree. I think the difference is we can treat each other not as enemies, but as human beings. If you can't be in the same room with someone who holds a different point of view than you without losing your shit or vilifying them or whatever, that's a problem. It speaks to either a tremendous amount of insecurity or intolerance or both. We have to be able to engage those we have tremendous disagreements with on issues of religion, politics, philosophy, ideology. We have to be able to engage and befriend people who hold major disagreements with us on these issues, because only then does meaningful discussion take place. It doesn't mean we have to endorse them or you know, love them with all of our hearts unconditionally. It just means we should be able to share the same space and have an amicable exchange, respectful exchange, without losing our minds and without being so intolerant as to sabotage the promotion of good ideas. It doesn't mean we just stop with, well, let's just agree to disagree. Sometimes you come there. Sometimes you hit that. I've hit that with my parents. But, you know, I, I don't think we always say, well, let's just, we have a disagreement. Therefore, those disagreements are equivalent. Our positions are equivalent, I think. Some of the best ideas are worth fighting for, and we should, but in the context of seeing each other as human beings first. I uh, like the idea, Katie says, of making sure the poor and needy have a great Christmas, but they can starve the rest of the year. Oh, are you, uh, is that a referendum on uh, Christianity's focused on charity efforts in the month of December? I get it. it took me a second. I'm sorry. I thought maybe that was your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do I say it? Is it silence? Said, uh, do you think it's worth arguing the internal consistency Bible with Christians or just avoid the conversation? I think it depends on the Christian. If you're talking about a Christian who's uh, doxastically open and interested in fresh perspectives, great, have the conversation. 
If you're looking at one of those glazed over religious mannequins who will not hear a syllable, you say, do not waste your time. Uh, Catton says, how do you feel about Wiccans? Cool. Uh, There are a lot of Wiccans, I think, who uh, don't hold to anything supernatural. They just enjoy the tradition and practice of Wicca. Uh, Great. Knock yourself out. I think tradition and ritual can help color the human existence. This is why I like Lucian Greaves and the folks at the Satanic Temple. I don't agree with everything that they do, but, uh, you know, they have... You know, realize that, I think Lucian uses the word utility. There is a utility to this type of practice or practicing of rituals, even religious ones, that help to color the human existence. They've rejected the supernatural portion of it, and they embrace the symbolism part, and sort of the theatrics of it, and the structure of it, and they use it for their own ends, being absolutely about honest, rather, about what... uh, the satanic temple is and what it isn't. So if Wicca or anybody else wants to do that, knock yourself out. Let's see. Any religious bands do I still listen to? I loved Petra, Andrew says. Nope. Um, you know, if, if an old Sweet Comfort band song comes on, I'll listen to it. Um, most of that stuff, I just... It might bring back a fond memory of a certain time, a certain event, someone I knew at the time, but I don't listen to Christian music for pleasure. Gory Yogi said, The power of life. How deeply did you live? How deeply did you love? How deeply did you learn to let go of superstitions? Excuse me? Um... Ian said, I come from a Baptist background. Do you find that Catholics dismiss disturbing Bible verses easier? I don't know. I know a lot of Christians that can dismiss it in a heartbeat. I'm interested, though, in the, in the idea in Catholicism that the Bible and Bible uh, education is supposedly the domain of the priesthood, meaning let us do all the thinking for you. You just come and we'll blow the smoke on you and we'll douse your kids with water and oil or whatever. And uh, we'll do our rituals and genuflect, and you can go on to your beer and bingo. Now, Catholicism's great at telling people, ah, oh, let the priesthood do the Bible thinking for you and tell you uh, what it all means. But I don't know, I've met some, some uh, Protestant Christians who were amazing at just excusing or discounting the awfulness in the Christian Bible. Uh, let's see... Wiccans said, Wiccans don't bother anyone else, so they're not a problem. The entire problem with big religions is their aggressive, power-seeking demands for compliance from everyone else. Several people talking about the band Striper. If you haven't seen the band Striper, they're talking about a band that we, uh, we knew as the Yellow and Black Attack. They walked around in the 1980s in yellow and black spandex with long hair and makeup, singing songs like To Hell with the Devil. Striper is still around. They don't wear the yellow and black anymore, I don't think, but they are still touring, and I believe they have a new album out that is called, and I shit you not, God Damn Evil. Or God Damn the Devil. Um, and Christ, some Christians wigged out over that. Oh, how could they use those words? The Lord's name in vain. Uh, Ranty says, what's your opinion on Jordan Peterson? I think he's hugely problematic. Thank you very much. When he told Matt Dillahunty that Matt couldn't be an atheist because Matt was too good, and when he starts speaking about the metaphysical substrate, sorry, sorry, move on. There's nothing to see here. Uh, was there anything else on anybody's mind before we call it a day today? By the way, thank you very much for watching. Thanks for your support. Uh, thanks for being a part of the community. As we head toward the Thanksgiving holiday, it is important for me to always take that time to, to remind you of uh, the important role that you play. There are so many different activist podcasts, streaming videos, so many different opportunities to connect or disconnect, and the fact that you're here and that it matters to you and that you're participating and that you might benefit from this and go out and benefit the lives of others and the activist thing that you do in your own life. That's, that's huge. And I want to thank you for being who you are 
and uh, for you know hopefully what is an honest pursuit of rationality the real world and truth honest thinking and the challenge of dishonesty out there in the world so um I'll do one more here because it looks like an interesting question. Incoming backup said, say what you think about people who say, I'll pray for you all the time. I hear it in two different contexts, and context matters. The first context is if someone doesn't really know much about me. They may not even know I'm an atheist, but let's say there's a challenge in my life and they will, because they have been trained to by family and culture, say, I'll pray for you. And they say it from a moment of sincerity because this is how they've been taught by their Christian culture to express sympathy and empathy. You know what? I'll I'll pray. I'll be praying for you. I'll be in prayer for you and your family. They won't say this usually if they know who I am and what I do. But if it's more of a cursory exchange and, you know, they say, oh, you've got, oh, your wife is sick. You know what? We'll, we'll be in prayer for her. I usually don't stop at those moments and say, you might as well be passing gas for her, right? Have you seen that person who took the meme and they replaced, I'll pray for you. And they took the word pray and crossed it out. And they said, fart, farting for you. I'll be farting for you. Our fart warriors are getting together tonight. We will all fart for your need. That's kind of how I feel about prayer. But I don't take that moment to have that conversation because what they said was a genuine and honest gesture of kindness. And I am willing in that moment to judge them by their intention. The discussion about prayer needs to be had. The efficacy of prayer needs to be had. But that is not necessarily the best time, right? In that sort of drive-by exchange with someone who I may not even know very well, okay? So, the second time I hear someone say, I'll pray for you, it is that nauseatingly smug and condescendingly pious thing. It just doesn't even come out of their mouth. It's sort of like a nasal kind of, I'll pray for you, right? It's when they are unable to operate grounded in science, reason, and the evidence. When you have stated a position plainly and clearly, when you are rightly keeping the burden of proof on people making these hugely grandiose claims about gods and monsters, and they don't have a leg to stand on, so the defense becomes, I'll pray for you. That's tough. I used to respond with the t-shirt, right? You pray for me? Great. I'll think for you. I used to do that. I don't do that anymore. But I don't have a lot of patience for it. Because they're not speaking from a point of empathy and sympathy. Desire to make me better. A desire to honestly represent me. Or even because they give a shit. I'll pray for you is actually a jab. These are weapons. These words are weapons that are designed to diminish you, to make you look like you are operating from either willful ignorance um, or you're being deceived by the evil one or you're just flat uh, dirty. You know, you're just flat sinful. And so their way of feeling more superior is to look down from the high mountain and say, I'll pray for you. I'm going to keep you in my prayers that one day, and it's usually along the lines of, I pray one day that the blinders will come off your eyes and you will see Jesus and that you will accept him back into your heart and realize the, the folly of your wicked ways. That's essentially what there's. I don't have much patience for that. Right? I don't have much. I don't know, and I don't deal well with those people. You know, they're not operating in good faith. They're not operating because they genuinely, honestly want to represent their own position or my position. They're simply building themselves up onto the high mountain, standing upon the religious perch, trying to look superior. I don't have much patience for those people. I'm more interested in people who want to be honest about these exchanges. So if somebody looks at me and says, I'll pray for you, you know, I might, I might just smile at them. Now, there might be another one-liner that slides out. It kind of depends on the person and the occasion. Circumstances matter. 
But no, I know it's it's hard. It's hard to listen to. I think at the end of the day, though, it's important that we that line that says we judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. Sometimes we're more forgiving toward ourselves because we intend something good, even if it comes out wrong. I try to, as best I can, try to discern the intention of the other person. And if their intention is genuinely to be kind. If I sneeze and somebody says, bless you, rather than stop and say, I don't believe in blessings. So you know that's based on an old superstition about demons and spirits inside, blah, blah, blah. If if their intention was just to be kind, that is not the hill I decide to fight on. I respond to their kindness with kindness. Thank you. And I move on. We as activists sometimes need to do a better job of choosing our battles. Because quite frankly, we can sort of chip away at the foundation under our own feet if we choose the wrong ones, if we get too petty. You know, if we sit around all day and all we do is scratch in God we trust off the money and write in, this is unconstitutional, we hand those out to everybody. I mean, what are we really accomplishing? Is this really the hill we want to fight on? We need to spend more time changing the culture around us and then the money and all those other things, you know, in God we trust on the pledge, all these other things. They will then take care of themselves, but the culture has to change first. And changing the culture means we interact with the culture. We have healthy discourse and dialogue, discussions with the culture. We help to change the minds of the culture and we're prepared to change our own minds when presented with better information. That is an honest approach to living our lives. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If we don't talk again before next Thursday, have a happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you soon.